Bill's mic and headphones just crapped out. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Awesome. <laughs> We should have done him first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Is it possible to get a DQ on a round table? <laughs> <laughs> Bringing you law, gospel, and guns. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. We made it! A hundred episodes! Can you believe it? You know, Ken Blanchard once told me that If your podcast makes it past episode 7, you're doing okay. Well, here we are at episode 100. Of course, Ken and Bob Main and the guys and gals at Polite Society Podcast are probably like, amateurs. But hey, 100 episodes is a big deal to us here at Armed Lutheran Radio. 100 weeks, 100 shows, 6 roundtables, 33 special guests who joined me for 40 different interviews over 70 ballistic minutes, over 40 episodes of Clinging to God and Guns with Pastor John Bennett, 17 midweek meditations, over 60 self-defense tips, over 40 tips from Mia Anstein. What a run it's been so far. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran. And this episode, actually the last 100 episodes, are brought to you by our fine sponsor, Cook's Holsters, American-made custom Kydex holsters with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, cooksholsters.com. So welcome to this special 100th episode, and thank you for making Armed Lutheran Radio a part of your week every week. It's because of you that we continue to do this. You find the show informative or entertaining, you let us know through your emails and your comments, and we keep plugging away. Plus, it's, it's fun. We're enjoying what we do. Now, I promised something special, and, and here it is. Today, for the first time, well, we've had 100 episodes and we've never done this before. For the first time, we have all four contributors together on the show at the same time. Now, when we got together for our first roundtable after the Orlando shooting way back in episode 23, Mia had not even joined the cast yet. So at that time... I guess you could technically say that at that point, we had all of the contributors together. But in our current iteration, which is what we've been, the way it's been since episode 29 last year, with Bill and Aaron and John and Mia, this is the first time we've ever gotten together with the whole crew. We got together after the election, episode 44, but Pastor Bennett wasn't able to be with us, so this is going to be the first time. We got together and we talked about our experiences over the last hundred episodes, you know, the things we enjoyed, the things we found interesting and fun. You'll get a behind the scenes look at how each of the contributors do what it is they do every week. And we talked about recent events, about uh, legislation and, and gun control and gun rights a little bit, mental health, um, the, the shootings in Las Vegas and Sutherland Springs. And then we look forward to 2018. It was a really fun show. It was, uh, I'm hoping we'll do more of these kinds of shows next year because it was really fun to have everybody together. And I hope you enjoy the show as well. Um, I think you will because it was a lot of fun to be with these great people and to, um, to record and and to edit. Uh, so I think you'll enjoy it. It's our last show of 2017. The next two weeks are going to be best of shows as we kind of, get a little downtime, retool, and get ready for 2018. We've got lots of cool ideas in store for you then. We're going to get started with this special episode after this brief word from one of our sponsors, the fine people who make all of this possible. You're listening to episode 100 of Armed Lutheran Radio on the Self-Defense Radio Network. The percentage of women who own guns is growing. American women are more knowledgeable and better equipped to defend themselves than ever before. So why is it that every time I go to a gun shop, I feel like they're talking down to me? Like, hey, little lady, let me show you what you need. It's like all they want to do is sell me a pink gun. If you're tired of feeling that too, 
Visit Guns for Gals, a specialty firearms boutique designed to empower women with information about firearm safety and to equip them with the means to protect themselves. The owners go out of their way to find products specifically for women, and they actually listen and ask questions to help you find the right products to meet your needs. If they wouldn't own it themselves, they won't sell it. Guns for Gals is located at 2035 Central Circle, Suite 108 in McKinney, Texas. Open Monday 1 to 6 and Tuesday through Thursday 11 to 7. And on weekends, you can find them at a gun show near you. Or shop online at www.gunsforgals.com. Guns for Gals, more than just a gun shop. It's how gun shopping should be. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. It's our special 100th episode show. We're joined for the first time. It's hard to believe. It's the first time in 100 episodes that I've gotten all of the contributors together on the same show. We've tried it before. We haven't managed to get everyone together. Joining me, Sergeant Bill, Mia Anstein, Aaron Israel, and Pastor John Bennett. Guys, welcome. Thank you. Hey. Thanks, Hi for there. Hey, hey. It's been way too long. It's been... Gosh, when was the last time we did a roundtable? I guess it was after the was, election. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So um, here we are, 100 episodes in, 100 weeks of Armed Lutheran Radio. Did anybody think we'd be doing this? That we'd be 100 episodes later, we'd still be plugging away? Thoughts on Yes. Your, <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> An optimist in the group. I love it. I'll be honest, when I first saw you post something on, on Facebook that you were looking for a pastor to help you out with the project, <laughs> I had no idea what the heck I was getting into. <laughs> but it's been fun. Well, good. It's, I, when I first came up with that idea to, to do the Clean God and Gun segment, I, I, nev- I wasn't thinking it was going to be one person joining me for the next two years. Um, <laughs> I figured... You know, I'd have a kind of a rotating group of people who would be interested. But after our first show, it was like I knew you were the person for the for the show. It was it's so it's been great. Well, well, thank you. It feels like my personal purgatory, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill, I asked from the very beginning, and and I thought, well, I'll just try to keep it. You know, it won't take a whole lot of your time. We'll call it the ballistic minute. And that lasted, well, <laughs> we didn't even get through one. You lured me in with candy and uh, free stuff, and, and, and I'm still waiting. <laughs> well, you came back after that first weekend with, what was it, three or four uh, segments recorded and said we need to change the name of the segment to the ballistic 10 minutes. Because you just couldn't stop talking about some of the some of your topics. It was like because I when you originally said that I was like a minute. Wow, I can't talk about anything for a minute. Oh my god, how am I going to do this? <laughs> the ballistic sermon. <laughs> That's right. Well, if you if you heard our um, our roundtable after the fall brawl, you know what a challenge it can be to just keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, since I've joined, uh, you know, I, I've been on a couple other podcasts before, but it's never been something that's, uh, you know, gone on this long, but I, I look forward to recording my segments and uh, it's a good time and it gives me something to listen to when I'm going back and forth for work. So good stuff. Awesome. We'll talk about, let's for, uh, I'll get to, to John, I'll get to you last on this one because your segment is a little different from the others. Um, for Aaron and Bill and Mia, you guys record your own segments. You come up with your own ideas. Very rarely, unless it's some special occasion like Mother's Day or Christmas, do I say, hey, record something about this. How do you guys come up with your ideas for what do you want to talk about each week? Let's go around the table and start with Aaron. I read a lot of uh, personal defense articles throughout the week. Uh, obviously, I contribute to Personal Defense Network, so I stay stay posted on what they got coming out in the newsletter. And then uh, you know, I read Grant Cunningham stuff, Greg Elavritz's page, uh, pretty much everything that's out there in self-defense media. And sometimes that I'll see something in there that, that stands out to me from another author. And of course, I always give them credit in the tip, but uh, that'll sometimes jog my memory. And then sometimes, uh, you know, something will come up in class or on the range and I'll jot it down in my notebook and, and record that. So it's, uh, 
And sometimes it's just kind of, hey, I know I got to record a segment and let me think of something and uh, it's kind of on the fly. So it just depends. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you write yours down or do you do you uh, jot a few notes? How do you or is it all off the top of your head? Uh, I usually do like little bullet points, like, you know, hit the high points and then just kind of talk through it. And I end up recording it like two or three times sometimes because I'll listen to it. And I'll be like, wow, that sounds terrible. And I'll do it again. <laughs> so uh, when I first started, I was actually scripting the whole thing. But then I, I listened to it uh, in my car a couple of times. And I was like, wow, you can tell I'm reading off of something there, you know. <laughs> so uh, so I try to be a little bit more spontaneous, but I use the bullet points most of the time. Cool. Mia, how do you, uh, you've, your segment is called Mia's Motivations. Your website is Mia's Motivations. How do you find wh what sort of things uh, motivate you enough to sit down and record something about it? Well, I think that I try to give a different perspective to Armed Lutheran Radio. Mm -hmm. And when we found each other on Twitter, I was really excited to see somebody that was a Lutheran and was sharing about guns. So that was really cool. And then um, somehow you discovered that I needed to be interviewed. So it actually worked out really well. But in that, what I've learned from listening is that um, I have an outlet that the, the rest of you guys don't have. And I really try to share it because I think it's something in me as motivations, I try to motivate people to get outside and whether it's hunting or shooting or different things like that. And um, I find the motivation to share that because there's a lot of people that really aren't aware of how they can get outside. And um, I find the time wherever and whenever I can. And I mean, I have recorded up on the mountains. I've recorded on my horseback. I've recorded in the truck. I've recorded in hotel rooms. I, you know, <laughs> so it's, and a lot of times I'm like, oh dang, I missed turning it in. And so I'm like, oh gosh. Um, and you're talking about scripting and I really do try to write it down or I'll send myself a text message and try to read that so that I can hopefully get you guys something that makes sense. <laughs> um, but when I'm, when I'm reading what I've written down, a lot of times I'll get other ideas. So I do go off script sometimes. Um, but I get my ideas when I'm traveling. I listen to other podcasts. Um, when I'm up guiding hunts, people will have questions. I'll have incidents that happen. And while we're out there, it gives me an idea. So I'll kind of write myself a note that this is what I need to record about. And then when we're at the shooting range, I learn things. And as you guys know, I've gone to different events and different places I teach. And I try to share that too, just to give listeners an idea of maybe how to get their wives or daughters into shooting or if if there's a lot of women listening hopefully they'll have ideas also all right bill your turn um how do you you early on you were most of your segments were recorded in your mobile studio and you had all the kind of the squawk going on in the background which was really kind of cool how do you um come up with the ideas for what you're going to record each each time that you sit down and do it and um, how do you approach it as far as do, do you, I'm going to assume you don't script it, um, but oh, how, to what, ex, to what, no, no, <laughs> to what, ex, to what extent do you script your, your segments? Okay. Um, so I come up with the ideas for it, mostly by stuff that I'm thinking about, or somebody's asked me questions about stuff, whether it's competitive shooter or somebody I work with, or even my wife sometimes. And I just go, oh, that would be a good topic. And uh, I have a little notes thing on my phone, mm -hmm. and I'll write down like a topic on there. And so then later on, later on, I have a uh, couple of like Sinopad notebooks. Started out with one, and um, I'll write down the topic on a page, and I'll you know write some stuff in there, and then I'll go back and look at it another day, and you know, and just add stuff to it or change things, and it's basically an outline format. Right. Um, and that's pretty much what I've done. It's kind of funny because one of the sergeants that I work with is a, is a writer. He writes science fiction novels. He said he just finished his third one. And he's seen me writing all this stuff, and he's asked what it was. And he's like, you've got three notebooks full of stuff. Why don't you write a book? <laughs> and I'm like, I might do that. You should. You should, definitely. So, and, you know, it's kind of funny because there's stuff that I go back and look at, and I'm like, you know, oh, there's other things I'd like to add to that. And I've done that. You know, you've seen some of the ballistic minutes I've done where it's something revisited. Yep. yep. So, you know, whether that's somebody said, hey, I heard you talking about this and, you know, what do you think about this? And, you know, just 
So that's how I come up with it. What was the last part? There was a last part to that question. Um, do, do I, do I, is it scripted? Yeah. Do you script it? Do you just sort of bullet point or, or like Aaron was it's, it's, talking yeah. about how he just sort of bullet points the high, the high notes. Yeah. It's kind of a bullet point outline format and I write down stuff that I, you know, Hey, I want to make sure I cover this. Um, and then I just kind of talk about it. Cause after you said, I don't have to, my ballistic minute doesn't have to be a minute. I was mm-hmm. like, well, hell, <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit. <laughs> that is never an issue. So how do you, no. so last but not least, uh, John, your segment is a little bit different. It's more collaborative. We work together on it. Um, but generally, um, after the first handful of episodes, you have been sort of the the idea person as far as, all right, we need to pick this article or we need to pick this video or, Hey, what do you think about this one? So where do you, where do you find these things? What do you look for? What to you is, um, what is it about an article or a video that says that jumps out at you and says, this is the one, how do you, how do you identify the articles that we, we critique? The one thing is that, you know, it's just fantastic that Google is such a left-leaning organization because for some reason it makes it easier to find the crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I look for two kinds of uh, articles, either the stuff that's really crazy and out there because those are the really fun ones or the, uh, the rarity of when you find someone who really makes a well-thought-out argument because mm-hmm. most of the time it's just, you know, left wing talking points. Yep. So do you, how do you prep for, um, for our segments? What, what sort of preparation do you, once we settle on an article, what do you do to get ready for the day when we record? Well, when we first started out, I would, uh, just type up all of my comments, but after the first few episodes, I felt that it was a little too scripted. So I just kind of went off the cuff as far as <laughs> our interaction over the microphone. Um, but the, my preparation was primarily just researching um, primarily the, the facts to debunk the terrible arguments that people are making. Where do you, um, what do you, how do you record? What equipment do you use? How do you set up your, and mo- obviously a lot of yours are recorded in the squad car. Um, the ones when you're not in the squad car, what are you, how do you set up and how do you sort of segregate yourself? Um, like when I'm, when I'm recording, I'm in my office, door closed, blanky wall up, you know, and, or I'm, uh, I have a, a walk in closet that does a real good job of dampening the sound. Uh, so I may record there. Um, what do you guys do when it's, if you're not out on the road or in your car or on horseback, how do you sort of set up your recording space? So, you know, I've looked at different people that do podcasts and I said, who was the most professional, most highly technically proficient person I know? And then I did the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve Anderson does exactly what I do. He hits record on probably his voice memo. Cause that's what I use on my iPhone. And I may hit pause five or six times, but pretty much it's hit record and go and whatever sounds you hear is what you get. Um, unless I say something silly and then I'm, you know, cursing and I go back and kind of record over that. But, um, (laughs) yeah, highly technical. So it was kind of funny. Originally I did it in the squad car, not thinking that, you know, mobile studio, it was just, that's where I was at the time. Right. And uh, I turned the radio down, but, you know, I still needed to hear it in case, you know, my guys got into something. And, you know, dispatcher pretty much never really shuts up. So she kind of got in there. And after I did the first one or two, you were like, hey, that's really cool. That sounds really good. Really, you know, how are you doing that with your police radio? And I'm like, well, I'm sitting in my dang squad car. (laughs) So (laughs) highly technical. Yes. Aaron, how about you? Uh, I've got a... Got the mic set up on a little mic boom thing in my home office and minus all the noise canceling stuff that you've got kind of, you know, same type deal. And Mia, you, you do a, your own, you've got your own podcast now 
and you've been doing the YouTube videos for quite some time. Um, how do you do your, if you're not out in the field recording, how do you set yours up? And, and well, it's actually, it kind of sounds funny, but when I'm at home, it's actually more difficult to find a quiet space. Um, <laughs> it's all, I mean, that's always the challenge is to find a quiet space. But at home, I try to wait till my husband's gone. And now my daughter's off at college. So that helps a little. But the dogs, they always want to hang out with me. So if I don't let them in the room, they're scratching at the door. Or if I do let them in the room, they're wrestling and growling. <laughs> so um, I have a spare room and I kind of use that as my recording space. And I try to just let everybody know you know be quiet don't make noise but a lot of times they'll come barging in or you know come to the front door and then the dogs are you know trying to attack the zombies and so it's a challenge at home <laughs> steve anderson dog noise <laughs> yes. ever heard that shooting show <laughs> john what about you 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 set up and you've got a really difficult situation when it comes to, <laughs> to your um, uh, broadband access. <laughs> You're in the middle of nowhere. I am. Um, I'm far away enough from town that DSL is unavailable. Okay. Um, we've had satellite internet before and it was just, I think dial up was more reliable than satellite <laughs> internet. Um, plus it was like, Dang near a hundred bucks a month, but um, my wife and I are on a grandfathered Verizon Unlimited plan, which Ooh. means we don't get throttled at all after we reach a certain uh, amount of bandwidth. Um, we easily do two hundred gigabytes a month between our two phones, <laughs> um, so it's actually really fast um, when it's working, which is most of the time. Um, but but every once in a while, I'll have to restart my phone just to get it working. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that gives everybody a little bit of an inside look into what we do. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit. of We're, we're going to get a little more serious for a segment. We're going to talk about current events. We'll talk about some legislation, some recent um, gun rights and gun control issues that have been in the news. You're listening to the 100th episode of Armed Lutheran Radio right here on the Self-Defense Radio Network. Hey guys, wanted to take a moment here to tell you about our membership site, the Reformation Gun Club. You can get access to exclusive member content, individual segments from each contributor, full-length guest interviews, and full-length segments of Clinging to God and Guns. We also have some members-only content that was never a part of the podcast at all. We'll send you some Armed Lutheran swag when you sign up, and you'll get special members-only discounts from Cook's Holsters, swag from the Armed Lutheran shop, U.S. Reloading Supply, Mission 160 Tactical, and Talon Gun Grips. New content is added Added every month and we're working to add new discounts all the time plus you'll have access to our private Facebook group where you can interact with other members and the show's contributors sign up for one year for 1517 that's in honor of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation or you can sign up month to month for just a dollar fifty a month check out all the benefits the discounts that's the Reformation Gun Club gunclub.armedlutheran.us as many of you know Sergeant Bill and I are competitive shooters we're also Reloaders. Bill helped me to get started last year, but I've still got a lot to learn. One thing I do know, though, you need a good source for supplies and components. So let me tell you about U.S. Reloading Supply. Yeah, there are bigger suppliers out there, but what sets U.S. Reloading Supply apart from the rest is their dedication to customer satisfaction. Check them out at usreloadingsupply.com. They carry the top name brands like Starline, Rainier, Berries, Remington, Spear, and Hornaday. If you've got a special order like primers and powder that you don't see on their website, give them a call for a quote. I did and got a great price. Excellent customer service, fast delivery, prices that include shipping, and a promise to match or beat any retailer's price, including shipping. Call them today, 941-451-7357, or visit them today at usreloadingsupply.com and use the promo code LUTHERAN2017 to save 10% off your order. usreloadingsupply.com. Welcome back to Arm Lutheran Radio. It's our special 100th episode roundtable. 
And um, this segment, we want to talk a little bit about current events, some of the things that have been going on recently. We talked, the last time we were together uh, was right after the election, and we were talking about some of the things that we hoped would happen under a Trump administration. One of those things was concealed carrier reciprocity. It only took um, 12 months to get it um, to the House. Uh, Thoughts on what's happened over the last week and a half with um, H.R. 38 and Fix Nix, which has now apparently been appended to it? Uh, I support uh, concealed carry reciprocity in principle. Uh, My only thing is is that I'm afraid to see what's going to happen to it by the time it reaches its final draft. Uh, The Fix Nix deal... Uh, obviously, you don't want that attached to it. You want it to be a standalone legislation so you can deal with that separately because when these things get attached as amendments, they kind of throw a bunch of stuff in there that they don't really talk about in the media and that doesn't get debated, mm-hmm. and then it ends up as part of the bill. So you got to worry about that stuff. But my biggest thing that I'm worried about is that the right to carry laws in the 50 states are so different from state to state, even like Texas to Oklahoma, uh, Texas to Colorado. Uh very different uh, as far as what the standards are for training, uh, what constitutes an in-state license versus an out-of-state license. There's all kinds of fine print uh, from state to state. And I just don't know how they're going to reconcile that when it comes to it. I mean, there's no way that that like New Jersey is going to let me carry with a Texas license in New Jersey. I mean, even if the law says they're supposed to do that, there's there's got to be some kind of a carve out there. And so you wonder what that carve out is going to be. And my fear is it's going to be a national training standard which is like a big step in the wrong direction because even in Texas where we have a state mandated training, that's the biggest excuse I get from people when they say they don't want to take a follow on actual training classes that, Oh, well, I've been through the license to carry class and I shot 50 rounds and I'm good to go. So (laughs) if you have something like that on a national level, then you're going to have problems. It's places where we don't have a training standard and we have constitutional carry where we have the most training going on. Like our classes in Arizona with uh, the ICE training company banner, they do really well out there and, and other constitutional carry states like that. So I, I'm afraid that that's going to be what's going to get tacked on at the end. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, then, you know, I think it could be a good thing. But, you know, anytime Congress starts to deal with something that really ought to be left to the states at the end of the day, uh, which I think if we're going to have licensing and not, you know, just mandate outright constitutional carry, then you're open it up for a lot of problems. So, But I think conversely, it could go to the extreme opposite and we could end up having laws like California where it's going to be so hard that nobody can get a carry license. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we're not seeing and we don't know is what what are the stipulations? What's the requirement going to be? Well, that's how we got Fix Nix teched onto this thing because they didn't even debate Fix Nix. They just threw it on at the end and voted on it with the we got to see some of that debate going into uh, getting HR 38, the the concealed carry bill out of committee. And then suddenly fix Nix is attached to it and we're going to the, to the floor to vote on it. It, there wasn't, so we still don't really know. I was surprised to see the, the text of the bill earlier when I pulled it up, I have still have not read the whole thing, but to find fix Nix tacked on at the end was a little surprising. And I agree having them separate is the best way to go. My I, biggest problem, well, I, I, I'm kind of with Aaron on this, is that they passed this. Um, we have no idea how exactly they plan on implementing it. But, you know, the, the, the Nix fix is what concerns me the most. But even from the side of, of the concealed carry reciprocity, um, if the government is the one regulating this, then are they going to make it more difficult to get a permit? Are they going to make you jump through more hoops? Are they going to make it more expensive? Mm -hmm. Um, Honestly, if they just passed a clean bill that says, you know, the, the, uh, the full faith and credit clause of the U S constitution requires states to honor the laws of other states in the union and all states must honor the concealed care permits of those states where they have been issued. I would be fine with that, but you know, that's not what it's going to be. No. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of the way that the bill, like the, the pure text of the bill without the amendments, that's, it reads pretty, pretty much like that. Like, you know, you have to recognize the laws of the other States. Right. But it's, it's when it gets to that 
you know, that other branch of government and, and all the regulations kick in and when they actually try to enforce it, that's, that's where it could get really crazy. So, and the thing that frustrates me the most is that the Republicans in the house compromised when they didn't need to compromise. Tacking on fixed snakes. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. They, and the there was no reason to do it. Should just be like you said. It should be completely separate. It should stand alone. And even though they're not, Fixnix isn't really making a lot of changes to the background checks. It's kind of more enforcing so that stuff doesn't happen, like we saw, you know, just a month ago. But it's it totally needs to be separate. It just doesn't make sense to add that on there. And I don't understand why they even added it. It's not going to change anything with concealed carry. It was probably, my guess is that squeamish Republicans thought the only way they were going to get Democrats to go along with it was if they tacked on fixed nicks. There's been a lot of debate about the fixed nicks bill and a lot of people screaming and yelling. NSSF supports it. NRA supports it. Gun Owners of America hates it. They, they're they out there and there's a bunch of YouTubers out there who are screaming, that, oh, you're going to... You're going to become, you're going to lose your second amendment rights because you got unpaid parking tickets. What's, what have you seen of the fix Nick's bill? Again, it's not, they didn't put it out there for a whole lot of consideration before they voted on it. What have you seen of it? What do you think of it? I've probably seen about the same stuff you have. I mean, I've seen, you know, the, the organizations that are more, uh, you know, in the middle, like NRA and NSF, NSSF support it. And then you see the, the more libertarian gun groups, you know, crying bloody murder about it. So it's probably somewhere in the middle, you know, I mean, that's usually the case with these things. So I haven't read it uh, in detail myself, but uh, you know, I, I, the reactionary piece of it is probably a little bit overblown if I had to guess. Yeah. The, the, I guess the thing that concerns me about it and Tell me if if I'm off base here, but when you're providing incentives uh, from from what little bit I read of it and sort of the summaries that I've seen uh, suggest that the bill is is providing some sort of incentive for the states and for agencies to improve the the their record keeping or to to report more people that whenever you do that kind of thing, it seems to me you create sort of an, a perverse incentive to, okay, well, if I'm going to get more money out of this, I'm going to report more people. I got to find more people to report, right? Yeah. And if you take that to the the gun owners of America extreme, then that means that they're going to, uh, you know, send people to your door if you have an unpaid <laughs> parking ticket. So, <laughs> you know, right. that's, that's the extreme it gets taken to. So, yeah. It, it's hard for me to kind of get you know, kind of really wound up on this because to me, it really boils down to kind of like a driver's license. If they want to do concealed carry and make it a national reciprocity, they need to realize that the same thing happened, you know, X number of years ago when every state had their own driver's license and their own way of having them tested and et cetera, et cetera. And they ended up having to do every state's driver's license is recognized by every other state. And until they do that or they just say, hey, you know, uh, constitutional carry or something like that, I, I don't really see it ever really working because every state is going to say, well, this is how we do it and this is the right way. So I don't see how you're going to get all these people together to find a middle road and make it all work. So it's, I hate to say I don't see it working. I wish it would, but I just, it, it's just going to, it's going to quagmire and end up dying. Mm hmm. I think the day after, like if it does pass, you know, and there's whatever the final version ends up being, there's going to be some guy from Texas who carries a gun in New Jersey and gets arrested and is going to be shocked that he's arrested for carrying his gun in New Jersey because he's got a license from Texas. And there's going to be some caveat he didn't know about, you know. So that's another one of kind of my fears about the whole deal is just the ignorance of what's actually in there is going to make people think something is true that isn't, you know. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. When I got my first concealed carry permit, I was living in Indiana and uh, it was great. You went into the local police department, you paid your $25 in your application fee and that's all you had to do. No class, uh, no expensive fee. It was 25 bucks good for five years. 
And uh, then I come to Minnesota where I've got to take an eight hour class. I've got to show proficiency at the range and all that. So how are, is, would this bill be able to draw a, a compromise between those kinds of requirements? You just couldn't right. do it. And that's what I was kind of referring to earlier is how, what, what extreme is it going to be? Is it going to be that you take an eight hour class? Is it going to be that you have to take a 16 hour class? And, you know, do you just have to show proficiency with the gun that your instructor has? Or do you have to show it with every gun you have in your house? Like, how, how do you know which the requirement is going to be? I mean, with the driver's license, there's universal tests that people take. With Hunter Education, it's even universal throughout the states right now. And you think and we'll just to have the right to carry is not universal through the states. I mean, there are states right now that you have to show good cause and basically convince the sheriff or whatever it is in your jurisdiction mm-hmm. to say, yeah, you're you need to be able to protect yourself. I don't, none of us need anybody to tell us that we can protect ourselves. That's BS as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, that's another extreme end of it. So they're not going to, it's going to be really hard for them to find a middle ground. Do you think one of the things that I was thinking about the other day was, and this sort of gets to the point you were making, Aaron, when you were talking about somebody's going to, somebody from Texas is going to go to New Jersey and be shocked to find that they can't carry where they think they ought to carry. Do you think that the if this were to pass, and I'm not optimistic that it will, but if it does, do you think that the response to it is going to be sort of like when we passed open carry here in Texas and start suddenly you start seeing 30-06 signs everywhere where you didn't see them before, where you're going to see more, um, yeah, you can cr- carry your gun across state lines, but guess what? There's not very many places in that state where you can actually carry be- without violating their state law. Well, yeah, some of the senators have already said things like that. Like one of the senators from New Jersey uh, talked about, okay, well, fine, you go ahead and pass this and, you know, we're going to make some kind of a ridiculous statute that says that you have to carry it this way or that way or you're still going to be illegal in New Jersey because they still have to respect that state's right to do that, right? So. Right. I mean, yeah. is it going to be that you have to carry it disassembled in your pockets or something like that? I mean, you, you know, I mean, there's <laughs> and there's there's actually been guys on the record already in anti-gun states saying things like that. So, yeah, yeah. moving on from that, uh, of course, we've uh, all of this is in response to the most recent the two most recent mass shootings, the the, the church shooting in Sutherland Springs, Texas, the Las Vegas shooting. Any thoughts on those two incidents? We're now 60 some odd weeks after Las Vegas and we still don't know anything. Um, any, any thoughts on that particular incident or, or why do you think it is that we still know so little about what happened? I don't think they know very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just a mass of data. I mean, you got the FBI doing it and you think of all the rounds that were shot, all the stuff that happened, all the people that were injured. The FBI doesn't do anything halfway. So, I mean, you're talking an investigation the size of which, I mean, they've probably never done. I mean, that's right. huge. The data and all the information they're trying to crunch and pull together is, it, I mean, it's got to be insane. I mean, the stuff that we do on just a single person shooting another person in Dallas is, you know, okay. there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, we're out on a scene like that for four or five hours. Mm-hmm. And then it still takes several hours to finish up reports and pull all this stuff together and process, you know, evidence and all that. I mean, you're talking a thousand times or more than that. I mean, that's... I wouldn't be surprised if it takes a year before they release any sort of report on that. Well, and as a result, of course, the left has proposed all their usual litany of gun control ideas. Have any of you seen anything proposed by anybody on either side that would actually have made a difference or would make a difference in the future? Well, no, I haven't. And even Diane Feinstein said that there was not a law that could have stopped that. No matter how many gun control laws they pass, if the government screws up, people can still die. Right. With that guy in Sutherland Springs, the response from our side is always, um, oh, hey, he f- the background check system failed. And then somebody like John Cornyn comes along and suggests fix Nick's. And a certain element of our side says, oh, no, we can't fix it. We need to just scrap it. Well, we got to we got to find a way to fix the system. And we don't want people like this guy getting his hands on guns. Yeah. The only thing that I think would have come remotely close was it would be some sort of restriction regarding mental health because he was reported to have had some sort of mental health problems. But then again, 
unless you sought treatment for that, how would you know? You know, are they going to create some system where, hey, uh, you know, I was talking to so and so and they were depressed, so I can go report them, and now they're going to have their guns taken away from them? Right. right, and that's something that a lot of people worry about, and they worry about even going to get medication because they don't want to be put on some list, and that's mm -hmm. a, a really, I think that's the bottom of the big issue is mental health, and that's something that we need to work on as a whole country because the mental status is what's causing a lot of it. And people are afraid to get help. They can't get help. And how do they get help? You know, and, and then in the meantime, they're worried that they're going to lose their right. Right. You know, about uh, eight years ago, I, I received treatment for being depressed, going through a tough time. And uh, some of the measures that be, are being proposed by the Democrats would prohibit me from owning a firearm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I don't think that even with, you know, and as the, the mental health side of the argument to me sometimes becomes a little bit of a red herring on our side of the argument, too, because we kind of always throw that out there when they throw out the, you know, let's go mm -hmm. after guns, we say mm -hmm. mental health. And there's some truth to it. But, you know, the kind of crazy that goes in and shoots up a concert, I mean, is like loony bin crazy. I mean, you're not going to be able to catch that just from some guy's doctor saying, hey, this guy needs help or whatever. So even the kind of laws that we're talking about and, you know, tightening the screws or whatever on mental health, I don't think is really going to catch the type of crazy that does something like that. You know, that's just a whole nother level of evil that I don't think any regulation could really, I mean, catch the guy unless you just happen to see him and talk to him and find out that he's planning wow. something like this. That would be the only thing that would really do it, you know? So right. And that's a be. really good point, Aaron, because I mean, just like we've been starting to see people are taking their trucks, you know, and other countries they are taking knives and just stabbing 22 people. You know? um, so, yeah, if they're crazy, they're going to be crazy. Yeah. Yep. Well, there is a difference. Uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, if you were deemed, you know, a certain level of crazy, I guess we'll say if you were schizophrenic, you're hearing voices, that kind of stuff, you would be institutionalized. That's a good point. That does not that does not happen anymore. Right. Those yeah. same those same people that would have been institutionalized for basically their entire life are now getting treated and released the next day with a uh, here try this medicine and see if it works. Yeah, I can remember working at uh, doing some community service with a church when I was in Oklahoma that was close to a mental health facility, and even the people that are that are getting treatment there just kind of wander off during the day and would show up at the soup kitchen, you know, all crazy. And it's like, you know, you don't, you don't keep them inside, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so yeah, it, it's a, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. We, we emptied the, because it was inhumane to, to institutionalize those people. We, uh, we basically turned them out on the streets in the uh, late seventies, early eighties. And when they're out there, they're not getting any treatment and they're not getting any better. Yeah. And I don't know about it, where you guys live, but I know here in Colorado, even in the small towns, homeless is just huge now. And uh, I mean, a lot of that is mental health issues and then a lot of it's choice. But that, um, I think, kind of correlates. There's a higher rate of suicides. The, it, all of it is just increasing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure exactly what the direct cause is of it. Yeah. And you go back to the the guy, what we know about the guy who did the Vegas shooting, though, and I mean, according to everybody that he talked to, even his own relatives were like, yeah, we, you know, he was just a guy, you know, there wasn't anything that really raised a red flag with us. And so he was doing a pretty good, a pretty good job of appearing normal. So how would we have caught that guy? You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't lock somebody up for antisocial behavior. And apparently he was pretty aggressively antisocial, but not the kind of thing that you would say, okay, he needs to be locked up. He just didn't like to be around other people. So there's lots of people like that. <laughs> I think there's more and more all the time. <laughs> <laughs> just go to Walmart. Just go to Walmart. <laughs> like right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. All right. So when we come back, we're going we're gonna to get away from the heavy stuff. We're going to talk a little more fun and uh, uh, talk about our favorite moments from the past Hundred episodes. You're listening to the hundredth episode special of Armed Lutheran Radio. We'll be back right after this. 
As many of you know, you'll likely have to win two fights if you have to use your gun in self-defense. The first fight is the gunfight itself. The second is the fight to clear your good name through the legal system. Even if you do everything right, you can still be prosecuted, which can cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Armed Lutheran Radio is proud to partner with the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. And while they can't completely take away that worry, they can give you the peace of mind knowing that you've got the financial and legal assistance you need to win this new fight. Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network can help. Go to my website, armedlutheranradio.us, look for the coupon code on the right-hand side in the sidebar, and sign up for Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network protection and save $25 off your first year of membership at armedcitizensnetwork.org. Join me, Pastor Bennett, Paul Lathrop, and thousands of American gun owners who trust Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network, armedcitizensnetwork.org. RG. Having a good holster is absolutely critical if you're going to carry a firearm for self-defense. If you need a quality holster, let me recommend Cook's Holsters. I've found Cook's Holsters when I bought an IWB holster to write a review. And I like that holster from Cook's Holsters so much that I applied to become an official Cook's Holsters dealer. Cook's Holsters are American-made, custom-molded to fit your firearm. The advantage of Kydex is that it holds its shape. It doesn't lose retention. It won't wear on the finish of your firearm the way leather will. They're available for hundreds of gun models, dozens of color combinations and different printed patterns. They're great for concealed carry, for range work. They come with a lifetime warranty against defects and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Check them out today, www.cooksholsters.com. Use the promo code ARMEDPODCAST to save 10% off of your order and make sure you've got a quality holster. Go to cooksholsters.com today. Welcome back to Arm Lutheran Radio. It's our special 100th episode roundtable. We're going to finish up with some, uh, with a little bit of fun. Talk about um, the past hundred weeks. It's hard to believe it's been a hundred weeks. Favorite segments that you guys have done. The one that you're most proud of, maybe from the from the past hundred episodes, or it doesn't have to be. You don't have to go back a hundred episodes, but <laughs> one that off the top of your head you really are, are proud of something that you did. I like the segment we did with the basement dwelling bong boy. <laughs> <laughs> that that was fun. That was a classic. <laughs> <laughs> that that if if we interpret the Second Amendment the way that uh, you know the Second Amendment supporters want to, that means everybody should have nuclear weapons, according to that guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or the guy with the um who was talking about the pooper scooper on your sword. That, <laughs> that one, I I had somebody, I think it was Bob Main from Handgun World who sent me an email after he heard that and he said coffee came out his nose when he was, <laughs> said he was sitting in the airport and uh, Pastor Steve Anderson, I think that was. Yes. <laughs> he's, a, <laughs> he's a good one past hundred episodes, any memorable moments, funny moments? Well, it wasn't an episode, but uh, one of my most memorable uh, moments from being a part of Team Armed Lutheran out on the range, uh, <laughs> hadn't shot an IDPA uh, sanctioned match in probably three years, and I went out to the, the Louisiana match with you guys, Yep. and the very first stage of the day, guess who's, guess who's first in the shoot? <laughs> no pressure, and no. Uh, definitely missed even looking at four targets. So that was a great start back into the IDP career. I was like, yeah, guys, I promise I don't suck. It's I'm, I'm better than this. <laughs> so that was, that was awesome. Bill's uh, singing intro to the, um, the fall brawl show was fun. <laughs> and, and the, I actually, I like that show a lot. That was, if you asked me, that was the one, I mean, it's the most recent in memory, but I like when we do the, uh, we did an interview show one time at a match. I can't remember which one it was. It was but Louisiana. Ball, same type of thing. Louisiana, yeah. Yep. We we're sitting down together face to face, not talking into a microphone or a phone or a computer or whatever. And it, that that's the most fun for me. And I think they're the most entertaining and fun shows. We got to find a central point where we can all get together and do that. Colorado's so, sort of central. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> we should all go to Pagosa Springs. That was an awesome trip. <laughs> so we need a Starbucks somewhere between Dallas, Fort Worth, and and Colorado. There's several in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> we need we need a we need a midway point. Go to the Starbucks app. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your favorite guest this year? 
that we had on the, I had, uh, or over the past hundred episodes, I've had a, a bunch. I, I didn't count them all. I should have done that. It's been. How do you remember them all? Yeah, no kidding. One of them turned out to be uh, a regular uh, on the show, which was has been awesome. That that was that was a fun episode. That was, I enjoyed that interview, and I really do appreciate that uh, that you even considered making it a regular after that. Oh, me? Yes. <laughs> I was like, who is he talking about? <laughs> I've missed this person. <laughs> well, then that's got to be my most memorable episode, right? Of, of course. I liked the Santa Shooter episode to hear his his story, the way that you interviewed him, kind of getting all those details because I'd heard about him in the media but had never heard him speak. And yeah, that was really interesting. I wanted to, that was, fun. that was a good one. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I wanted to, to walk through that experience step by step. Where were you? What did you do? What do you remember about this? How were you turned? Where were you facing? All of that stuff that in a lot of those interviews you don't get. And I wanted people to be able to sort of see what he would, or in their minds, what he was seeing and, and understand how it must have felt to be in yeah. that situation. And we yeah, I thought it was, were able to visualize everything. Yeah, I thought it was cool how you kind of, uh, he admitted some lessons learned, like, you know, I could have done this better and, you know, I should have had a holster and things like that, that, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, everybody else just kind of has him throw out the, the, you know, broad brush strokes on what happened, but you kind of, you know, really walked him through each detail of it. And, you know, I felt a lot better about how justified that situation was after hearing that interview. So that's the episode that made me sign up for Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. I remember because you messaged me. <laughs> what about the yeah. trucker? The trucker one was a one that I actually had a lot of friends listen to that when I shared it. Yep. Paul Lathrop. Yeah, that was a good yeah. one too. And that's another one where I, instead of just saying, okay, well this happened and this happened, I wanted to go through step by step exactly what happened. Where were you? Where were you in relation to this guy? All of it so that you could, you could get a sense for exactly what, I mean, short of actually being there or seeing it on video, understand what he went through and, and what happened and how absurd that whole situation was. Yeah. Um, and, and it just kind of shows you like the possibilities of, you know, not even using your gun or brandishing it or anything and what can happen. Yep. Final question, plans for 2018. What have you guys, what are you guys thinking about doing for 2018 in terms of hunting and training and competition teaching definitely going to continue on shooting the uh idpa uh i should i'm going to shoot my first steel match in a while this weekend and so <laughs> we'll see how that goes but uh, definitely 2018 more idpa i'm thinking about doing some uspsa too uh hopefully i can talk bill into coming out and shooting with me for a couple of those so i'm not the only idpa crossover there <laughs> but uh oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so definitely more competition team arm lutheran stuff i'm looking forward to doing that again uh on the class side uh you know i'll be continuing to uh teach my normal one and two day defensive shooting classes uh i'm not going to do licensing anymore I'm kind of moving away from that because i haven't seen a whole lot of people that want to get their license and then actually come out and train so it's kind of like you know why am i why am i doing this if uh if people just want to check the block i don't want to be that guy you know mm -hmm. so uh moving more focused into just the one and two day defensive shooting classes. And then also uh, I've had a couple of churches reach out to me since the Sutherland spring shooting who want to do some, uh, some training. So uh, one of my uh, former pastors, when I was out in uh, West Texas, uh, he's moved to the Metroplex recently and he's got a church here. And uh, so I'm going to do some training with uh, some, some guys in his church, his, uh, his elders and, and some other guys that he has kind of in an informal type security team. So uh, hopefully that'll turn into not just a one day class, but a continuing relationship with them is kind of a, on a consulting basis type of deal. So uh, doing a little bit more of that as, as churches reach out to me and also with small businesses as well. So hopefully it'll be a good year for, uh, for training and competition. I'm looking forward to it. Sounds good. Mia. So uh, 2018 is going to be another busy year uh, with Leah heading off to college this year. My husband and I actually have tried to free up our calendars, so we're not doing as much of big game guided hunts, mm -hmm. but we're still going to do turkey hunts. And then as far as the big game, we're going to do a lot of um, wounded veterans and stuff like that. So more of a um, outreach hunts instead of 
charging people to come hunt with us. Um, and then I'm for my personal hunts, I've got a whitetail hunt coming up just after the first of the year and we'll be hunting mountain lions and waterfowl. And then, um, as far as teaching, I'm still going to be teaching a lot of the beginners with handguns and rifles and shotguns. And um, I've got a lot of hunter ed classes lined up this year. So that's that's the big thing is hunter education and outreach. And then I'll be traveling a lot for speaking. Very cool. Are you going to yeah. do are you going to do shot this year, next year? Yeah. Yep. I'll be there. I've got to go. Got to find a way to go. NRA's yeah. in Dallas this year. I have yeah. Noticed. And I'll see you all in Dallas this year, too. Very cool. We'll have to, there, we can do an in-person roundtable. Yes. That's true. All right. We just got to get um, a um, an airline ticket for John so he can come. Greyhound. Greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you'll have some good stories about concealed carrying in some very dicey scenarios. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> if I get there in one piece. <laughs> How about you, Bill? Um, 2018, uh, crush my enemies, see them driven before me, hear the lamentation of their women. So pretty much the same as 2017. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, so I, I did a little bit of training last year. I did Rob Latham class, did a couple other little things. I did Aaron's awesome little class. Not little, but it was two days, so it's little. Um, it was an awesome <laughs> class, by the way. Oh, and by the way, Aaron, I've been meaning to tell you this, and I keep forgetting. My son was doing one of those VR games, you know, the little mask that goes over their face. Uh-huh. And it was a zombie thing, and it scared him. And I swear to God, I saw you in the class doing the startle response as he was doing <laughs> exactly what you said. He dropped yes. his level. His hands came up. I was like, oh, my God, Aaron was right. <laughs> Instincts are a thing. <laughs> it was fantastic. I was like, I should have got that on video. Oh! That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, no, but the training wise, I do want to do some training with some instructors that are kind of going to go by the wayside here pretty soon. Like uh, Ken Hackathorn has said that he's pretty much done after this next year, maybe one more year, a couple classes. Um, handgun combatives. Who's the one who does that one? Dave Spaulding. Dave Spaulding. Dave Spaulding. I'd love to get out to his class. Um, there's just a lot of really good old school instructors that are, you know, going to be finishing up soon. Uh, my, I have a real close personal friend, Joe, that has been to Thunder Ranch many times, and he's talking about trying to get us to go to Thunder Ranch in the spring. Uh, Clint Smith is, you know, one of the greatest instructors there is. And how many more years does he have left? Really? I mean, I'd like to get in some classes like that. Um, competition wise, I am going to start shooting a little more USPSA and I'm actually going to be changing guns. I'm not going to be shooting any of the plastic fantastic this next year. Wow. Yeah. Going to, going to shoot some heavier guns, some 1911s, some double single action stuff. Um, I actually have a SIG at the SIG armor right now, uh, 226 that hopefully I'll be getting back in a few days and can't wait to start playing with that. So, I mean, it's not like it's anything new. I, I worked for many years carrying a SIG 226, trained with it a lot. So it's, you know, the only difference will be shooting in a competition. So, but it, you know, just little changes. Um, and kind of doing the same stuff, maybe not shooting as many IDPA matches, but I do want to get out and shoot more. Um, just cause there's a lot out there, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of people to meet. There's a lot of, a lot of experiences that, you know, I still would like to do. I'd still like to check off that, at least my shooting bucket list, you know, <laughs> so no better yep. time than the present. Absolutely. Tomorrow, I promise to nobody. So John, how about you? Um, well, I'm hoping to finally get some training, uh, this next year. Um, I kind of live in a wasteland for (laughs) nothing being available. Um, shot a little bit of IDPA last two summers, but it's a 40 mile trip one way for a informal unofficial club. Right. I would have to drive over a hundred miles to get to, you know, an officially recognized IDPA club. Um, but there's a, uh, there's a guy that uh, teaches a defensive focus shooting class in the twin cities area. So I'm hoping I get the time to take that. I actually uh, talked my wife into the importance of, of me getting additional training and she's okay with it. Um, I didn't tell her what the class costs though. So we'll see how that goes. (laughs) Take her with you. (laughs) Great idea. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Well, and and that's, that's twofold. You said she wanted to start carrying, so she needs some good training and she's going to get a good foundation when she starts to, you know, learn and practice the things that she basically has no idea 
of the bad habits that a lot of people have that, you know, Aaron can tell you that he has to try to help them unlearn. Yeah. And Jeff will take care of you out in the Twin Cities. He's a great instructor. That's that's the guy I want to take the class with. But uh, aside from that, um, I really want to see if I can convince my wife to just start practicing with me. And it's not like I have to go far for that. I just walk into my backyard and start shooting (laughs) targets. So just don't have your, just don't have your wife be in the class that you're teaching. Just (laughs) right. uh, Word word to the wiser. (laughs) (laughs) Can your wife tell some stories? Is that what you're trying to allude to there? Oh, you'll have to wait for the real housewives for that one. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, and, um, no, I, my, my wife has only shot in a gun once in her entire life. Um, I was on my vicarage and uh, she asked me what I wanted to do for my birthday. And I knew she'd never shot a gun and I knew she was still somewhat anti-gun at that point. So I said, Hey, why don't you let me take you shooting? And, um, she liked shooting this little 22 revolver that my father had borrowed to me. But, uh, then she pulled the trigger on my 1911 once and that was enough for her. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little twenty two pistol that I'll start her out on and work our way up from there. Yep. No more 1911s. No, no. Actually, <laughs> I don't own any more 1911s as much as I love them. So. Oh, it's okay to own one. You just don't want to carry it, kind of like you own a Model T and don't <laughs> drive it to work. <laughs> right. <laughs> My first gun was a 1911, and I carried that for a few weeks before I realized I need something that's a lot less weight than this thing. I- I carried a three-inch Colt Defender when I started carrying concealed, so I'm allowed to talk trash because it was me. <laughs> well, thank you all for everything you guys do. Um, you know, whenever I am interviewed about the show, I can't help but give credit to you guys for how good the show is because it w- it's nothing like I imagined it would be when I first was planning it out. And thanks to you guys, I think it's great. And, um, and I really appreciate everything you do. So thank you so much. I can't wait to see what we do in the next 100 episodes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, you for having us, Lloyd. And that's going to wrap it up for this special 100th episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. Thank you so much for being with us again this week, for downloading, for subscribing, for sending us your comments and your questions. We really do appreciate it. It means a lot to us. We enjoy what we do here, and we really appreciate your support. I want to thank all the people who made the last 100 episodes possible. Mia Anstein, Sergeant Bill Sylvia, Aaron Israel, Pastor John Bennett, all of the special guests, all of the members of the Reformation Gun Club, Cook's Holsters, U.S. Reloading Supply, and Guns for Gals. All of you, thank you so much for your support. I say this every every time I do an interview, every time I talk about the, the podcast. Um, this show is nothing like I imagined it would be. It is so much better, and that's all because of the great people that I work with and the sponsors who support us and you who listen, download, and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for a great 2017. Hope you have a great Christmas. Let's not forget the reason for the season. It's not about the gifts you give. It's about the gift that you've already received, the promise of life eternal through the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for um, for listening. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Christ blessings to every one of you and to all your families. Thank you for your support. We'll be back with you next week with a best of episode. Until then, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and tune in. This podcast is made possible by Cook's Holsters and contributions from listeners like you.